Hi doctors. It's me again, Pearl. I hope you're doing great so far with your review. If you have just started, then I'm glad that you're checking on our videos. Out of the 150 MCQs, majority of the AMC exam comprises of adult health. In this video, we'll be tackling the first 10 questions in the adult health section in the AMC handbook. But note that some of the concepts have already been discussed in our previous video on AMC images, so I hope you also check this out. The link is found in the description box below. Now let's get started. The lesion shown has been present for six months on the face of a 50-year-old farmer. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Implantation dermoid cyst. B. Basal cell carcinoma. C. Amelinotic malignant melanoma. D. External angular dermoid. E. Keratoacanthoma. The illustration shows a typical nodular basal cell carcinoma or BCC. These tumors are typically found on the face, but unlike squamous cell carcinomas are also often seen in non-exposed areas. B is correct. Implantation dermoid cysts form firm, subdermal cystic nodules following penetrating trauma, often on fingertips of mechanics. Amelinotic malignant melanoma usually lack the pearly edge of a nodular basal cell carcinoma. External angular dermoids are congenital developmental inclusion cysts, seen as subcutaneous lumps at the lateral angle of the eye. Keratoacanthoma can usually be identified by its central core. Next. The lesion shown has been present on the foot of this 38-year-old farmer for three months. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Malignant melanoma. B. Neuropathic ulcer. C. Infection with Burkholderia pseudomali. D. Necrotizing fasciitis. E. Erythema abigni or pigmentation from heat. The lesion has the appearance of a nodular malignant melanoma. A. Is correct. Any change in the appearance of a pigmented skin lesion should arouse clinical suspicion. The lesion will need complete excision and histological confirmation. Neuropathic ulcers characteristically occur over pressure points in insensitive areas associated with diabetes, syphilis, leprosy, and other neuropathies. Limb lesions due to Burkholderia pseudomali are usually in the form of subcutaneous cellulitis following skin abrasions. Necrotizing fasciitis causes a spreading anaerobic subcutaneous infection, often crepitant with subcutaneous emphysema. Diabetics are particularly prone to these infections. Erythema abigni describes cutaneous tanning caused by chronic local application of heat, like from excessively hot water bottles. Next question. A 60-year-old woman presents with a pigmented skin lesion on her leg, as shown, which has grown in size over three months, and has occasionally bled when she scratched it. You arranged excision, which confirmed the diagnosis of 0.3 mm thickness malignant melanoma on histology. In discussing prognosis with the patient, which one of the following features is the most important prognostic indicator? A. Site of the lesion on the body. B. Width of the lesion. C. Color of the lesion. D. Thickness of the lesion. E. History of bleeding. The most important prognostic indicator in malignant melanoma is thickness of the lesion. D. Is correct. The rest of the choices are not prognostically significant. Now remember the ABCDE of melanoma. Asymmetry. Border irregularity. Color, diameter. And evolution over time, which is of sudden change. Also remember the type of melanoma that has the highest prevalence is that of the acrolentigenous type. These concepts have been discussed in the AMC images video. Please check it out so you don't miss out. Next question. The 70-year-old man whose photograph is shown has had the painless lesion shown on his lower lip for the last six months and it is slowly increasing in size. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Herpes zoster. B. Herpes simplex. C. Squamous cell carcinoma. D. Basal cell carcinoma. E. A malignant melanoma. The lesion is characteristic of a squamous cell carcinoma. C. Is the answer. On the lips they are found on the mucosa of lower lip, related to solar exposure. Basal cell carcinoma and malignant melanoma rarely involve the lip mucosa. Herpes zoster infection on the face gives clusters of vesicular eruptions related to the distribution of cranial nerves 5 and 7. 
Viral herpes simplex of the lip or cold sore gives a classical painful shallow ulcerated acute lesion, usually self-limiting. Next. A 51-year-old man sustains burns in a house fire in which he ran back into a burning room to bring out his daughter. The room was full of acrid smoke from burning clothing. He was burnt on his face, trunk and arms and the burns were judged partial thickness, involving 30% of the total body surface area. He speaks in a husky whisper and there is singeing of his hair and eyebrows. Which one of the following actions should be undertaken first? A. Insertion of an intravenous catheter. B. Endotracheal intubation. C. Silver sulfadiazine dressings to the burnt areas. D. Administering systemic antibiotics. E. A bolus dose of opiate. This man has life-threatening injuries. The ABC of resuscitation, airway, breathing, circulation, must be remembered. Airway management is crucial. In this instance, a number of important clues indicates that he probably has upper and lower airway injury. Not only will he have inhaled smoke, but it is quite likely that some of the clothing may have given off noxious fumes, capable of damaging the respiratory epithelium in their own right. His hair and eyebrows are singed, suggesting extremely close contact with the fire. He is likely to have a burn injury to his upper airway. He is speaking in a husky whisper, which suggests that he has already developed laryngeal edema and potential airway compromise. He needs to be intubated and ventilated before strider sets in an intubation becomes impossible. B is correct. But if pre-oxygenation is among the choices, that should be done first while preparing for intubation. Intravenous access is also important as this man will require large volumes of fluid rapidly, but this can be done once the resuscitation team is confident that they have control of the airway. He will also need analgesics, antibiotics, dressings, and antimicrobial creams to cover the wounds, but these are all of lesser initial importance. Next. A 45-year-old woman presents with a history of multiple subcutaneous lumps. She has noted them for many years, they do not bother her unduly but are occasionally painful. On examination, she has multiple discrete focal lumps beneath the skin surface of various sizes up to 3 cm in diameter which are soft and lobulated, some are mildly tender. She has about 20 in all which are situated bilaterally in the upper and lower limbs and on the trunk. There are no associated skin lesions and she has similar lumps removed. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? She can remember her mother having had some, but otherwise in good general health. A. Neurofibromatosis type 1 or von Recklinghausen disease of nerve. B. Adiposis dolorosa or Durkheim disease. C. Multiple symmetrical subcutaneous lipomas. D. Multiple desmoid tumors. E. Multiple epidermoid cysts. The clinical scenario fits the diagnosis of multiple symmetrical subcutaneous lipomas. C is correct. The physical findings are clearly those of multiple discrete lipomas in subcutaneous fat. Most such lipomas are non-painful and non-tender. Often a family history is present, suggesting an inherited tendency. The lesions are entirely benign. In comparison to neurofibromatosis type 1 which usually has the stigmata of caffeolae spots, pedunculated and sessile skin lesions, the relationship of the subcutaneous swellings to peripheral nerves and their firmer consistency, and the associated anomalies and multitude of signs, will usually make the diagnosis obvious by pattern recognition. This is not the answer. Adiposis dolorosa is a term better applied to diffusely painful subcutaneous fat deposition without focal discrete lumps. The syndrome is most common in middle-aged women and the painful fatty deposits are mostly confined to abdomen and thighs. Desmoid tumors and epidermoid cysts are found in the Gardner syndrome variant of familial adenomatous polyposis. They are invariably attached to overlying skin. Next question. An 18-year-old youth presents with the changes shown in the photograph. This condition has been present for many weeks and is the sixth acute episode he has suffered over the previous three months. Which one of the following would be the most effective treatment to offer the patient? A. Regular salt water bathing of the toe. B. Application of an antiseptic dressing to the edge of the toenail. C. Long-term antibiotic therapy. D. Wedge resection of the affected region. E. Phenol injection into the affected area. The most effective treatment for this recurrent problem would be a wedge resection of the region, with removal of the ingrowing edge of the nail. D. Is correct. The rest of the choices are only temporizing measures. Next. This is the photograph of the natal cleft region of a 28-year-old man who presented with an intermittently discharging swelling. 
The anus is at the bottom of the picture. The discharge has been offensive smelling and associated with some pain. Which one of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? A. MRI scan to define the anatomical boundaries of the underlying fistulous tract. B. Computed tomography to define the underlying abscess cavity. C. A prolonged course of antibiotics. D. Laying open of the fistula between skin and anal canal. E. Excision of the sinus and underlying cavity. This is a pilonidal sinus. Classically a secondary sinus lies to one side of the midline. The primary sinus is present but not easily visible in this case. It may form tracts through which secondary sinuses occur from rupture of an infected cavity with abscess and granuloma formation. The cavity persists because of the presence of these foreign bodies. Once infection sets in, antibiotics will be of limited value. If an acute abscess is present, it will need incision and drainage, but in this case where the sinus is discharging chronically, the most appropriate treatment is formal excision of the area, including secondary and primary sinuses, and underlying cavity and contained hairs. E is correct. Last question for this video. A 65-year-old man presents with a three-day history of a rash on his feet. He had just completed a course of trimethoprim for an attack of prostatitis. He woke up with the feet reddened and hot and both feet seemed equally involved. Over the next two days his rash persisted and there was blistering on both sides. An illustration of his feet is shown. The line markings were made the previous day. He has a history of chronic arthritis of his knees and back, for which he takes regular paracetamol. He remembers having a rash with the same distribution after being treated for a urinary tract infection some years ago. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Acute gout. B. Ryder syndrome. C. Bilateral streptococcal cellulitis. D. Fixed drug eruption. E. Systemic lupus erythematosus. The rash has typical features of a fixed drug eruption. D is correct. It is very symmetrical and unusual in distribution, affecting the soles and ankles, but sparing the distal feet. This is almost certainly a reaction to trimethoprim. Acute gout can be symmetrical and affect the ankle and tarsal joints with redness of overlying skin. The degree of blistering in this case would be unusual for gout. Ryder syndrome is a condition that occurs predominantly in young men and can present with urethritis, joint pains, and occasional cutaneous manifestations hence the mnemonic, can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. His condition could be confused with bilateral cellulitis, since there is inflammation of the skin and the line markings on the skin are those of the previous day, indicating a resolving inflammation area. However, it is most unlikely that he has suddenly developed a symmetrical bilateral streptococcal cellulitis, and that a prior drug intake is of significant consideration. Systemic lupus erythematosus may present with cutaneous manifestations, usually a rash on sun-exposed skin, especially over the cheeks and nose. Thank you for watching up until the end of this video. I hope we're able to help you with your journey. Good luck in your exams.